Okay, so welcome everybody today uh, for, your, uh, for your fundraising and COVID webinar. So we're thinking about everything that community businesses need to know about fundraising right now. Uh, just again, double confirming that you're on mute and your, uh, your videos are off. Everything that we uh, record today will be made available uh, to you at a later point. So we're going to be here until uh, half past three and we've got time for questions at the end, but we'll have about an hour uh, for our speaker today, Leah Selinger, to, uh, to share with you some of her tips. And then you'll be encouraged to use the chat as we go through uh, today's session. So what we're going to be covering is uh, what's changed in the funding world for community businesses, what's available to you now, including new streams of funding, and what you can expect to see over the coming months. So I'm just introducing you today to Leah Selinger of Selinger Consultants, who has a wealth of experience um, in fundraising and strategic support for voluntary sector organisations. Uh, she's worked with lots of charities and social enterprises, uh, just like yourselves. And so I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen now and hand over to Leah, who will be with you for the next hour. So Leah, if you'd like to start we'll be very happy to hear from you well lovely thank you very very much um i was going to share my screen so hopefully you can all see that so um thank you very much for a lovely introduction lucy and lovely to meet you all thank you for those of you who've introduced yourself in the chat that's great um as um lucy quite rightly said i'm here to talk to you about fundraising in a post-covid world and i know we're we're still very much in the midst of a covid world and post-covid maybe is a bit optimistic but i guess i'm looking to the future in today's session um so hopefully that will help us think both now but also into the future um, and this has already introduced me and you've started to introduce yourselves in the chat which is wonderful um, but just so I get a little bit more of a sense of the kind of organisation you are I'm actually just going to ask you to um, respond to uh, three questions on a poll which I'll launch now so it's, this is a zoom poll and you should have the first question um, which comes up on your um, on your screen so you should ask the first question, which is, is your organisation, and there are four answers, delivering as before COVID, um, delivering a very different offer to that um, before COVID-19, doing a mix of what you did before and, and new offers, or not doing anything at the moment? Um, so this was just the, the first of the three questions, just to get a sense of where you are. Um, as Lucy said in the introduction, I'm a trustee of a community business myself, um, and we're very much doing that mix. So. That we've got most people have voted now so most of you 73 percent um are delivering a mix it looks like and 26 percent are doing um 20 percent roughly doing um something very different and only one of you seven percent doing nothing at all so let me oh i managed to accidentally at so sorry did you see the answers there yeah so you can see the answers to that first question i'm just going to launch the second question now so so most of you are by, by far delivering both. Let me see if I can get the second question going. Here we go. Let's launch the second poll. Um, oh, yes. So the second question, here we go, is have you seen your income increase a lot, increase a bit, stay about the same, decrease a bit or decrease a lot? So where is your income? Um, so most of you, I guess, unsurprisingly for community businesses, have, the majority by far look like they've decreased a lot or a bit, but there are a couple of you who had income stay about the same or even increase. Thank you very much for that. I'll end the polling on that one so you can see the results yourself and you can see 60% of you have shown a significant decrease and 80% um, in total have had a decrease. So not an unsurprising amount as I'm sure you can imagine. And I've just got one more question if I can make it do it. Come on polls work, work for me. Right, um, hold on, let me, ah, oh, where's the poll? Sorry guys, um, here we are. I've managed to make it work. And my, my final question, just for you to get a sense of who else is on the call, is have you accessed new income streams at all as a result of COVID-19? So if the answers are yes, no, we haven't tried, or no, we tried, but we weren't successful. Um, so yes, most of it looking like a, a significant proportion have. Um, there we go. So 65% of you. Um, I think that's everyone, so I'll end the polling and you can see that. 75%, um, so 65% of you have indeed accessed new income streams, which is great. And the, the equally split, 18% both ways, either haven't tried or weren't successful in trying. That's really helpful. Thank you um, very much for everyone's um, 
um, input there. I'll just stop the share of the results. Um, just to get a sense of where you are. So I think there's a real mix. And there's definitely some trends and some obviousness. But just for me to get a sense of where you are and where you're feeling, that's useful. And hopefully I'll be able to shape today's content a little bit based on those responses. So as Lucy said, um, there were kind of um, three objectives really for this session. And I've kind of phrased them this way. So the first is to help you understand the fundraising landscape and how it been and is being shaped by the current pandemic. The second is to have an understanding of where fundraising might be heading in the 2020s in the light of what we've seen over the last six months, but also just in general trends that are perhaps in existing before COVID took place. And finally, knowing where to look for funds as you support you through this um, the next time and what steps you might want to take. As Lucy said, um, throughout today, um, do feel free to put comments in the chat as we go through. If they're relevant at the end of each section, I will absolutely um, respond to them. I might just pause and ask those questions directly to write at the end if they're a bit more general or to take us off down a, a more um, general track. So please, please bear with me as we go through. And Lucy is going to be helping me just make sure I don't miss anyone's questions as well. So today we're going to cover four four kind of sections and at each point I'll make sure that you, you're following me and you can use the chat to check in. The first is going to be the impact of COVID-19 on the voluntary sector and, and income generation. The second is going to be looking at where next for income generation in the voluntary sector. The third is where to go and how to look out for opportunities and the fourth is the next step so how are we going to do that. So I'm going to kick off with the first section then which is the impact of COVID-19 on the voluntary sector and fundraising. And I think there are three main areas of impact that we've seen that are relevant really to, to community businesses. The first is financial. The second is about donor. So um, how the public have responded, the people behind gifts, but also buying purchases of services, their experience in response. And the third is about grant makers, funders, how have they responded to this? So I'm going to go through each of these in turn and draw upon research, um, work that's been done in the sector by a range of organisations, things that we've perhaps seen in the press um, or been aware of on social media. So the first area is um, financial impact and I, and I pulled out some of the headlines that maybe you may have seen um, over the last few months. So from Beginning of June from Pro Bono Economics, the headline charity is facing 10.1 billion funding gap over the next six months. Uh, late, a few days later in June, we had a key vote um, in the third, se in, um, third Sector magazine tell us a poll found that most charities have had to cut frontline spending. And a few days later, 18th of June, um, we had a um, study come out from the Institute of Fundraising and Charities Finance Group which said that charities are facing a £12.4 billion shortfall in income for the year due to the impact of coronavirus. And we've also had um, MPC, New Philanthropy Capital, have been keeping track of redundancies over the last um, few months, looking at where redundancies have, have taken place um, and over sort of five and a half thousand redundancies to date in the launch sector reported. So. I think there's quite a lot of stuff out there which can make you feel quite anxious and a bit like, oh my goodness, what's happening to the world? Everyone's is all going to pot. But for me, I would make this caution, which is beware the perils of self-selection bias and small scale surveys. So the Akivo quote that's um, up there about the, the um, charities having to cut frontline staff, there are 124 responses to that survey. So just to put it in perspective, there are 166,000 registered charities. Um, and that's not only including, that's not, that's just charities, not just all community interest companies or businesses um, or even very small organisations within the launch sector. Um, the I, I Institute of Fundraising um, quote in the Charity Finance Group, 101 responses um, responded to that, to generate that quote about £12.4 billion shortfall. So 101 responses, mostly from bigger organisations, so nearly 40 um, sent only 40% of respondents had a turnover under 100,000 but actually that's more than 80% of the sector so very skewed so a little bit tricky to, to kind of so it's an accurate reflection so and although those redundancies are significant and of course it's heartbreaking for those five and a half thousand people in the charities they work for to have to make those redundancies actually the most recent NCVO Almanac data says there's more than 900,000 people working in the sector. So this is 0.06% of the, of the workforce. So I think while there are 
absolutely impacts. And I saw from your survey results there that most of you have seen some kind of decline in your income. It's also bearing it in mind that, you know, when we see in these headlines that it is discard, disguising the massive variation there is within the voluntary sector in terms of size, in terms of scope, in terms of the, the sector that you work in within that, whether it's health or arts or community. So I think my caution to you is, yes, things are challenging, but they're not completely challenging. Remember also that the organisations who are likely to respond to those surveys completed by Institute of Fundraising or Pro Bono Economics and so on are those that possibly are delivering their services, they have more time on their hands, those who have pivoted, as the language of the day seems to be, and are really responding well to things, haven't got time to respond to surveys about how well they're doing. So there's a self-selection bias in this as well. And I'm part of a network of consultants, and we had a long conversation about this a couple of weeks ago, and actually we've seen, we've seen this very much happening. And while there are some organisations in some sectors, some arts and community, of, of particularly arts organisations, obviously one of those who've perhaps invented most at delivering services and, and generating income. There are also a lot of organisations who have been completely able to deliver, deliver new work as most of you are, to respond, to think in different ways and use those to advantage and I'll touch on that again a bit later. So, so just bear in mind when you're seeing the headlines, a little bit of a pinch of salt with the numbers. I think it's also interesting to see the impact on um, that we've had with the government pushing for us to become community businesses and to generate income ourselves over the last 10 or so years. So I started working in fundraising, you know, almost 20 years ago. Um, and when things like Future Builders were just starting, which was a push from government to say, oh, charities should be delivering services. We need to get them to the point where they can do trading and raise income. And, and we've seen that as a push in the, in the voluntary sector, charities developing trading as a, as a real way to become sustainable. And of course, what we've seen with the impact of COVID is that that it really has been the one bit that shut down quickly. Those charities that perhaps haven't innovated have been reliant on grant funding and probably those that have been most sustainable and successful over the last few months. And I just thought it was interesting to show you this graph which demonstrates to you the um, over time the um, growth of income, earned income by the branch sector. So this is taken from NCVO's Almanac data and you can see that back in 2000-2001 only around 7% of um, income from all branch sector organisations um, was generated by from earned income and earned activities are things like um, delivery of contracts, so service delivery but, and charity shop but also um, earned income through events um, and sales of activities sales for activities that take place in an organisation. So as community businesses, it's likely to form a significant part. And they, back in 2001, it was 7%. It's wobbled around, but it's generally risen. And the last data for which it's available, 2017-18, um, it was up to 12.6% of the charity sector's income was from earned income from the public, as opposed to donations from the public. So I think it's just quite interesting to see the way that that income has become a much more fundamental part of the sector as a whole and our income, but also what COVID has shown us is actually this is the one area that's perhaps going to be most most hard most hard hit by the by the financial challenge. What about community businesses in particular? How's the financial impact of them? So I've had a look at Power to Change, who are obviously a key funder of community businesses and support of community businesses, to see what they had to say. Um, and remember even within the community business sector, diversity is huge. You know, some people will respond positively and gain, others will not. Um, this early analysis is, is available on the um, Power to Change website, but I just pulled out some of the, the key um, points that they've, they've found. The first is that, and unsurprisingly, community businesses have seen an increase in demand. And of those businesses, community businesses, 62% of community businesses earn most of their income from trading. On estimated that around 43% of the income comes from venue based activities and it's likely to be those activities which are going to be the hardest hit of course um, and the impact has been sector specific so community pubs for example have, would have been hit harder than perhaps other vision. However those who have managed to adapt have done better than ever 
So the power to change um, respondents showed that over half of the community businesses expected to open up a new line of trading activity or diversify the work that they offer as a result of the pandemic. And actually your response to those polls at the beginning shows that that feels very accurate. Um, the, the, the study they produced responded that 46% of the community businesses that they, they looked at had responded and removed to remote services throughout the pandemic um, and over you know, another quarter had basically changed their model in some way to respond to community need directly. It really shows us that there is an amazing you know, resource there in community businesses to respond and adapt as well as, well as being impacted, very much echoing what we're seeing in the broader branch sector. And just because I made a point about numbers, for reference, there were 449 respondents to the survey that community business did. Um, so just, you know, doing that. just to let you know, I, I did look at the numbers for this one as well. Um, they were estimated sort of 9,000 or so, think, they think community businesses, but they don't know exactly. And they didn't manage to weight the information because the data is not available to do so. But they, I did look at that, in case you were wondering. So the financial impact you see is quite diverse. It's depended very much on the um, size, the scope, the nature of the organisation. But I think also just remember that point, take it as a pinch of salt, sometimes what you see. So what about the donor impact? What have we seen about donors, the people who both buy and donate, buy, buy services, but also donate funds? So NFP Synergy undertook a survey in June, um, which showed that while the number of people giving dropped to the lowest level in a decade, actually giving has stayed the same the amount of giving has not significantly changed online giving has increased the public are saying they're not stopping giving and actually average amounts donated by those who too are keeping giving have increased so the the, the net effect has actually balanced off um, the nfp have been monitoring this stuff for a long time as you can see from the 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 chart on the screen over the last sort of nine years, you can see that dip. But this, remember, this is numbers of people who say they donated to charity. So while um, it was 78% of the population said they gave to charity in some form in July 2011, down to 60% in May 2020, and that's just dropped from 70% in May 2019. The reality is, yes, it's less people, but they're still giving and they're giving more. So people are still supportive of charities in that way, which is useful to see. There's also an agency called Blue Frog um, and their blog, which is given on the screen, queerideas.co.uk, is a very interesting, um, they do lots of interesting trend analysis on um, the individual giving behaviour. Um, and you, they're due to update, a, 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 this is the information on the screen is from their third report, which was in mid-July. Um, there were actually to do a fourth, but because things are changing so quickly, they've delayed it for another few weeks. So keep an eye on it if you're interested on donor behaviour about COVID-19. But largely what Blue Frog have found is that levels of giving haven't changed very much overall, which is similar to what NFP had said. And donors are tr starting to change the way they've give, so giving. So the way perhaps they were giving to NHS charities or particular charities that were responding to need as a result of the COVID um, pandemic. So for example, domestic violence or food bank charities, they're now starting to revert and going back to those that they've traditionally supported, especially if it's a cause that they think may have been neglected. So for those of you who are perhaps working in the arts, for example, an area that feel like, oh, this, this is an area that I believe in, it needs to survive. They've, they've historically given to arts organisations. We might see donors start to come back and actually arts and international development are already starting to see that bounce back. People are coming back from those COVID affected charities and frontline services dealing with the, the impact of coronavirus back to that. The other area that continues to be popular is local charities where donors can see the need and the money in, and what the money is doing. So charities that have responded particularly well, I'm sure some of you as community businesses will have done exactly this, um, have been tackling the worst of the impact of the pandemic at local level, have been continuing to access that support. 
So if donors are looking promising, what about grant makers? What do we think? And for me, this is where we've seen some really interesting trends and ideas emerging as a result of the impact of COVID. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, back in March 2020, um, the London Funders Group put out a statement um, responding to COVID-19, um, which has now been broadened out more widely and around 400 funders right across the country have actually signed the COVID-19 Funders Pledge which ultimately says that they want to be as helpful as possible. They understand that the organisations they support may not be in a normal position. They're going to have to respond differently and support them in a different way. We've also seen a load of resources coming up through funder groups, for example, Association of Charitable Foundations and London Funders, who have put a whole resource hub um, designed to supporting funders to respond to the changing needs of society in a COVID and post-COVID world. So what, what, what can they do to think differently, to act differently, to maintain some of this momentum that we saw from this you know, signing of a statement back in March, right through to now and into the future. So funders are really taking this seriously and seeing it as an opportunity to look afresh at the way they support community organisations, large sector organisations. Um, the Association of Charity Foundations, ACF, have been tracking a lot of these responses um, and you can look on their website to see some of the, the work that they've been doing. But they pulled in together some good practice recommendations um, that I think are quite interesting to see about the way that they think grant makers should be behaving. So I pulled out some of them here, um, building trust and acknowledging unequal power relationships, particularly relevant as I mentioned later in relation to things like Black Lives Matter, um, the, a kind of agenda going on behind the scenes. Um, application processes should be simplified, accessible and non-discriminatory. The consultation and meaningfully involving representatives and communities and funding decision making processes, so making it more meaningful, not simply behind cold doors or a panel of old white men sitting there making decisions about something that isn't to do, it's service not for old white men. Um, and when you fund mainstream organisations, asking for evidence of how they work along grassroots and specialist organisations in the community. So actually recognising as a kind of fallout from COVID-19, the unique response and opportunity that small local grassroots community-based organisations really have with understanding and, and also addressing and responding to the needs of their communities. So I think there's some really interesting stuff that, that's coming out of, of the grant makers. And finally, for me, there's one um, potential holy grail, some, you know, a beacon of light in, in this, which I think if we can be realised, it'd be fantastic. And that is that funders have started to um, understand that charities need to be responsive, be flexible and have core costs um, covered to make an impact um, to charities and financial sector organisations. So we know that the world is not going to be the same. The new normal will not be our old normal. And the funding landscape is being shaped, like, shaped by that, as, as we see. Funders over the last few months have, have started to give core grants, core grants to organisations to do what they do and to gain all the benefits along with it. And I'm not the only person in the sector who has a feeling of hope that actually within grant makers and organisations that that might be a maintained process. There's a win-win to it. Us as voluntary sector organisations get the benefits of funding to do what we need to do to make it happen, to be creative in the way we do it, but to deliver real impact. And actually funders get a win as well. They get to claim the whole impact of the organisation rather than just two or three outcomes which we deign to say you funded these. Um, you found to be capital, MPC have also echoed this call and there's a, there's a link to a blog there called Is the Future Unrestricted um, Charity Funding Post-Covid-19 and I think there's a few of us in the sector who are hopeful that this, this may happen. I'm just going to pause at that point just to give you a quick chance to ask any questions or to make any notes on anything I've said about the kind of financial, the donor or the funder impacts that we may have seen over the last few months. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of um, moments just to put anything in the chat, in the chat box of any questions or comments before we move on to the next section, which is looking forward. Okay, nothing coming in at the moment. I'll give everyone a chance to type away. Okay, nothing coming. I'm going to go with, I'll move on. Okay, 
I'll move on. If there is any questions or comments, please do put them in. I'll respond to them at the end if I don't get a chance now. Okay. So, um, so given all that, given where we're at and the changes we've seen and I've run through, where next? Where do we go with um, income generation? So times, they are changing. Um, now, COVID obviously is clearly a big thing on the agenda, um, but also things we can't lose sight of. Firstly, the Black Lives Matter agenda, and that is something that is really impacting the way the voluntary sector is working. And more broadly, not just Black Lives Matter, but diversity and, and equality um, is, is coming out with it as well. Um, and finally, there's something about Brexit. I know it feels like something on the on the back further, it feels like very distant and off, you know, in the future, but we've seen over the last week it's come back onto the agenda um, and uh, what is the finan financial impact likely to be to the economy of, of Brexit. I'm just reading a little comment in the um, question from Lucy, what can community organisations do to better influence their funders? I'll try and address that a little bit later if that's all right Lucy, I'll keep going for now. Okay, um, so I'm going to quickly look at just some of the, the impacts. I think um, regards things like COVID, Black Lives Matters, diversity and equality, Brexit, I think the general feeling is that there's going to be a very different shift in the way that the voluntary sector is perceived and understood and funded and supported. So big charities are not losing support, but the, the balance of power is shifting from the largest organisations to the small and community organisations. And we've seen that with the rise of kind of localism and COVID, as I've explained. Um, the quality and diversity agenda is growing. Funders, particularly grant makers, as you saw from some of those points made by the ACS recommendations, are really something that funders are going to look for. So I think the, the future feels uncertain. The future feels worrying. We don't know what's going to happen with the economy, but also I think there's some really interesting things that are going to happen and we need to think about how we as voluntary organisations understand and respond to those. So I'm going to cover some of those things um, and think about especially the economic impact of that and fundraising as we go forward. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'd like you to put in the chat box um, an answer to this question. If you had to plot on a scale of one to ten, how trusted charities are, voluntary sector organisations are, what number would you put on the scale of one to ten? So this is a, if you can do that, I'll keep talking. Just stick a number in the chat box just to see what, what people think. But um, this is a, there's a survey done by the Charity Commission. It was last completed in 2018. Um, a scale of one to 10, how trusted charities were. So I'm gonna give you the answers in a minute, but I just wanted to see what you thought. So we've got a range of numbers coming through. Nine, um, we've got a four, a couple of sevens, six sevens. So you're mostly hovering around the middle or there's some more optimistic, some more pessimistic. Yeah, most of you seem to be about six or seven. Um, with regards to how trusted charity. It, and Madeline said, it does depend on charity and scandals, absolutely. <laughs> So I think that seems to be that the main is sort of around the middle. So I'll just show you the, um, oh, oh, sorry, hold on. Ah, come on, wait, right, show my little box, with my box? Oh no, oh, sorry guys, right, hold on. Right, there we go, now you can see it. <laughs> so here you can see the, um, the actual graph. So this is the numbers that have, um, over the last few years. So from 2005, 2018 is the data that's available. It hovered around six, in between six and seven. So those of you who said six and seven, you were bang on. And it dropped quite sharply from 2014 um, down to 5.7 in 2016. And then um, when the survey was undertaken in 2018, 5.5. And absolutely, Madeline's completely right. It is about scandals. So what we saw um, post-2014, where that drop happened, we saw things like the Olive Cook, situation where which was the um, old lady who was said to have been hounded by direct mail and by charities fundraising on the phone it was unproven that the reason she took her own life was the charities but that was the that was the press scandal around it that was in 2015. We had things like Age UK um, who were offering energy tariffs from E.ON, if you remember this story, basically they weren't very good value for money. That was 2016, so charities were seen as scamming older people. We had the kids company situation with safeguarding issues in 2015-16 and Oxfam 2018. And Sally's absolutely right that we need to differentiate between local and national charities, but unfortunately the press doesn't. The press looks at those big national charities which are doing this work and 
the, 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 the branding is charities, not national charities. And yes, you're absolutely right, Sally, small local charities aren't the ones involved in these kind of scandals. But the impact is on us as the voluntary sector and the charitable sector as a whole, unfortunately. So while the bad behaviour may not be ours, actually we are starting it does impact on us at a local level so this is this is where we're on this is the climate i think that we maybe find we're working in what's interesting and if i go to the next slide um see um that there's this is the a woman's trust barometer so they they undertake a uh an analysis, an international, Edelman take an international analysis of public trust in different areas, not just in the charitable sector or the not-for-profit sector, as they, they call it, the, um, the NGOs, non-governmental organisations, it's international. Um, they also look at the public sector, private sector as well. And they undertake um, analysis regularly on trust and, and thoughts in charities. And the most recent study was um, completed earlier in 2020, um, and actually, um, the number of people who said that they trust UK charities to do what's right for society um, jumped up um, between G January and May 2020, partly as a result of, of COVID. And it was actually 54% of people said that they trust charities to do what is right for society. Um, but to put that in context, 62% of people at that point, this was back in May, said that they trusted the government, which had risen, um, to do what's right. Um, whereas globally, 62% of people um, trust businesses, um, the same global score for charities. They don't break down the, those figures um, for the UK, unfortunately. And the graph you can see on your screen shows a kind of uh, an axis of unethical to ethical competent to less competent and while UK is pretty much on the, the line of the, the unethical to ethical it's pretty much in the middle it's perceived as more incompetent than most other countries in the French sector um, the other countries so we are hovering around the same space as Japan and Ireland and the Netherlands not far away but actually oh, we're, we're doing much better on competency than somewhere like Italy or Germany but actually there is there is a kind of understanding of the voluntary sector isn't necessarily a, overall and while there is that difference in national and local and international we're not seen in the voluntary sector as incredibly competent um, which is again part of this impact that we have from the press picking up on particular scandals reducing that trust in charities and we have as a voluntary sector to fight that even as small local organizations were having to respond to what's going on nationally and in the national press, unfortunately. So how does that impact on fundraising? What's the impact of fundraising climate on that? Well, I think reality is it's tough. It's tough out there for everyone, economically, but also because of what I've just given some perspective for. Um, we have this cynical public, typically unsupportive media. Um, you know, they absolutely loved Captain Tom walking around raising money for the NHS, but that was an individual, not a charity. Um, we've also got challenges like the corporate market, which is not going to bounce back anytime soon. It's been pretty much flat since 2009. We haven't seen more money coming out of businesses despite the, the, the rise in the economy from 2000, after the 2008 um, financial crisis, responding and bouncing back. We haven't seen it. However, let's try and give it some positives. Despite all that cynical public and that negative press, public giving is received, is maintained. It was on the rise before. We saw the, the impact of COVID, as we've seen, that's been maintained. Trusts, grant makers are still there. They're still propping up the sector, at least for now. Um, and COVID-19 has provided new opportunities. And I think that's what I've seen from your responses to the polls earlier and what we're seeing in the, the evidence is that um, COVID-19 is providing new opportunities for grassroots community projects to, to grow in terms of their profile and their reach and the way that they respond. Remember, the public does still account for 47% of the sector's total income, and then that's split between those donations and service and in, um, income from services and, and sales, for example. Um, and it's been the biggest growth of any income stream over the last 10 years by far. Legacies um, have continued to grow, for example, from donations over the last um, 10 years, and it's expected that the number of legacies will also continue to grow as it becomes more prevalent and younger generations understand the importance of legacies. Although the immediate impact of the financial crisis we're about to enter means that in reality, the amount might drop slightly because houses are worth less, for example. And it's also to note that the public 
individuals in any way are the largest income source for most subsectors and that is not likely to change in the next few years. So while it is tough and we are fighting, there are also some really exciting opportunities for us as businesses to go forward. So what about fundraising in a recession? Brexit tells us we are, you know, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with Brexit. We're, we're still in the midst of it. Um, but if, they, if we're in a predicted recession, either as a result of Brexit or and or as a result of the ongoing coronavirus, um, what can we learn from the 1990s um, and the 2000s, late 2000s recession? Well, we'll be able to learn some things, but I think it's also important to know that um, we can't necessarily learn everything because we're not in the same situation. We are expecting more of a global response because of COVID um, rather than just a UK recession. So we have to bear that in mind. Um, um, so there's limited learning that we can solve. What we do know, however, from 2009, 2008, is that recession generally saw that low level um, donors, so those who purchased or donated at low level maintained. It was the high net worth individuals and major donors which dropped. During COVID-19 we didn't see the same thing. The last six months haven't seen that same response. So can we draw the same from the session? We're not sure. Um, we did also, you also see causes shifting. So during COVID-19, domestic violence, food banks, we saw that in the recessions, the causes that people gave to shifted. So again, those, those um, services which directly responded to in the fallout of recession, um, those who required extra support, things like food banks and domestic violence, um, were, were, were more likely to get responded to during that period. So donors do respond differently and different causes will have different experiences from this. The NCVA Almanac shows us that it took around seven years for the large sector to fully recover from the 2008 recession. Um, so that's in terms of their level of net assets. It income bounced back after about five years. So about 2013-14, we actually saw income for the large sector bounce back to where it was at 2008. And it's also interesting that people have said that it's not necessarily the recession that impacts on people's ability to give or purchase services at a local level, but actually the um, unemployment or just fear of it. And so that's something we might expect to see in the next couple of months at the end of furlough. And um, we'll have to wait and see what the impact is um, with individuals. It's also interesting to note that what we have seen in previous recessions is that corporates are the first to go. Um, the fact that they haven't responded and it's been flat since 2009 kind of demonstrates their kind of un, the, the less ability they have to respond and support the voluntary sector in the main. Um, but we have seen grant makers pull out all the stops. We have seen them respond. And actually in the um, couple of years post 2008, the amount of money they gave was much bigger. Um, they, they spent out to their limits as much as they could to support the process when perhaps statutory bodies had less money, when individuals may have had less money. So they are prepared to support it. And we've seen similar response over the last six months with COVID as well. So it'll be interesting to see um, how that works. Obviously, grant makers, charitable trusts, the majority of them are impacted by donation, um, by investments. So if the economy is not doing well, interest rates are down, then grant makers have less money to give. So while now they might be continuing to give at least the same level and more, if the economy declines, then it's possible that in 2021, we will start to see grant makers have to pull back a bit simply because they have less money to give out, their investments are lower. So we'll have to wait and see on that one. The one lesson, however, is that anyone has said from the recession, um, the last two, is don't stop fundraising. The, the worst thing to do is get rid of your income generation staff, volunteers, whoever it is who does it, who stop, don't stop asking, don't stop fundraising, because that's the one thing that will reduce your income, is not asking for money, whoever you ask for it from, don't stop. So we've had a little look back and seen what we think about is going to happen and what we've seen in the last six months, maybe what we might be expecting to see broadly. But what about trends? What about areas of income generation and fundraising changes we're expecting to see over the next 10 years, I've given myself a 2020, for the next few years at least. So none of what we're likely to see is going to change significantly, but I think there will be some shifts in the way that people and organisations respond and give. And the first thing to think about is digital, uh, particularly mobile, mobile devices. So um, I think we've seen 
how important digital has gone. And I was reading something today that can you know 75 percent of organizations have made a sh shift to digital service delivery in some form um, over the last six months and I think that is more significant um, and we're going to see the importance of that um, over the next 10 years. It doesn't mean it's a magic bullet. Making online services doesn't solve all the problems. I don't think it is the solution, but responding in a way that people are able to, to support your organization, get involved in your organization, having digital as a channel for you to access supporters and deliver services will, will not go away. And linked to that, there's a sense of personalization. You know, particularly millennials, and we all see it even when we're doing our online shopping, is you know the pop-up ads that I happen to have searched for a new lawnmower. I'm only ever seeing adverts for lawnmowers. You know that personalisation that particularly millennials are expecting to see in their Instagram feeds and the way that they, they receive their news and information. We're going to see that more and more needed and wanted by donors, by supporters, as we go forward with income generations. So thinking, how do you? personalise your service and respond to that using digital but also offline techniques. For me there's something also about place-based or community focused organisations. Um, place-based really was something that's dri driven by the arts world and something that's been in the arts world for a few years now but this idea of a community focused and a, a geographically focused response and again I think this is something as I mentioned before we've seen get more important during COVID-19, people understanding the, the role that community organisations and those closer to local community um, communities can offer, but that's not going to go away. We're going to see that increase and um, we're seeing donors look for that, ask for it, we're looking at major donors wanting to support in local areas. Impact is, a, is my next one and impact is not new. Um, by impact, not outcomes is what I mean. So not the changes that occur, but the long term, broader change that those outcomes achieve. It's not new, it's something we've seen bubbling up and emerging over the last five, ten years, but it's going to continue. Um, and even something like National Lottery Community Fund, who historically have been an outcomes funder, have now shifted to funding impact. There is also the benefit of impact that it hopefully makes grant makers more flexible in terms of what they fund, reverting back to my holy grail of unrestricted. And lastly, but by no means least, um, I think there's a real thing we need to understand in, in the voluntary sector broadly is that competition that we might be facing from perhaps non-traditional voluntary sector organisations, be those charities, voluntary sector um, community community interest companies, community businesses, whatever, individuals and corporates are kind of moving into our space. So organisations like Extinction Rebellion, which have no legal entity, or Led by Donkeys, which is ultimately a campaign group that raised something like four or five million pounds to their initial campaign. Um, it's not an organisation. Neither of them have a legal organisation. There's no regulation or transparency but at the same time, those of us who are charities have got the Charity Commission responding to regulations even more than ever. So there's a fight for space with those unregulated organisations. Um, projects like GoFundMe, where individuals are raising money for particular causes. Again, they're individuals, it's not an institution, an organisation, we're in competition. Um, and even companies, something like Tom's, who provide shoes. Every, every pair of Tom's shoes you buy in office or you know, shoe or whatever, they give a pair to a child in sub-Saharan sub Africa. So there's a space um, issue, which I don't think is going to go away. If anything, it's going to get bigger. So how do we as community businesses, community organisations, charities, hold on to the space that, that we think is important um, and, and make sure that we work alongside those organisations, not to undermine them or say they're not of value, but how do we claim our space in that? How do we um, retain our identity and use the fact that we are you know, regulated and transparent in the way that we operate to our advantage. Okay, um, and before I move on, I'm just going to pause again very briefly, just to, um, before we move on to looking at um, other opportunities, just to ask if there are any questions or comments um, at this point. Um, and I'm just going to just go back to the question that was asked earlier by Lucy, it's a good point to answer it here now while I'm going to think about it. And Lucy asked, what can community organisations do to influence their funders to ensure they're better aligned with community organisations' real-time needs? And I think, for me, that's about talking to your funders, talking to those who support you about what you know and about the fact that you are in touch on the ground. So relate, fundraising is never just about write a bid or send a letter or have one conversation. 
a really great fundraising tools to develop a relationship with those who support you, you know, those individuals or organisations, it doesn't matter. So keeping that relationship going is important. So if you, if you do something, you find something really interesting through conversations, through a survey, through focus groups, through co-design of services and activities, then let your funder know. Tell them it's totally fine to send interesting you know, things about the work you're doing if aligned with what they funded to your funder before a report is due. Don't feel you have to wait till the end of your project when you've got to send your annual report in. Actually say, look, we're responding in this way. Why not? You know, you know put it in their inbox. If they don't read it, then that's, it's not the end of the world. But you've had that chance then to help them understand how you um, understand what's going on and hopefully you know, the commissioning cycle where you can then influence the way they're going to give as well. And no other questions have been come into the chat box while I've been talking, in which case I'm going to move on and there's plenty of time to ask questions at the end. So I'm going to move on to the third section, which is just to look out for opportunities. So where is this funding? How do you find out what's around both in COVID time, COVID response, but also in the future? So for those of you who haven't come across it, um, the Charities Excellent Framework is a website designed by Ian McClintock. It's an online resource which is um, designed to support fundraising. Um, and one of the aspects of it is a searchable COVID funder COVID-19 funder database. Um, it's updated regularly by a team of volunteers who maintain it. They keep the date that it was last checked or added so you can see the relevance. It's searchable by a number of different criteria, so location, amount, category and so on. So if you haven't um, found that website, then charityexcellence.co.uk is a great place to start. Um, it's got, I, mean, I think it's something like 600 or so entries um, which are COVID response funds, so not all relevant to every organisation, some of them are very local or to certain um, needs, but definitely worth having a look. You do have to register to access the database, but it is free to do so, and there's a load of other resources to support a bunch of sector organisations on the Charity Excellence Framework as well. So I might mention that one for those of you who have not come across it. Some others that you may have seen, um, which are both generic databases, but also COVID specific. Charities Aid Foundation has got a very long list of COVID specific um, funding opportunities. So you can get that at cafonline.org. Um, they've got a very long list of um, these. I will make sure that I'll ask Lucy to send out these slides um, later today as well, or tomorrow to you. Um, so you've got those links that are on the slides so you can access those in your own time. So don't feel you have to scribble them all down now if you don't want make sure they're sent out for you. Um, so CAF is one. Grants Online is a database, grants database, which is normally paid for. They do have some access to coronavirus response opportunities available for free on their website, but it's traditionally a, a paid for database. Funding Central, which is NCVO's funding database, fundingcentral.org.uk, um, they that's a, um, a database of searchable funding opportunities. For those organisations with a turnover under 100,000, um, it is free. If it's 100 pounds plus VAT for those with a turnover over 100,000 um, pounds, it's uh, again as an all-year-round funding database, coming up with mostly grant-making um, organisations opportunities. They send regular, you can say how often you want them, but weekly email alerts, um, setting out different opportunities for funding and highlighting COVID related ones in that. So for the new opportunities that are coming on, if you're not signed up, um, then you can. Other places that you might want to think about if I'm not already tapped into them, um, sources of, inca of, of um, information, um, your local community council function service, sorry, CVS, um, you can go to NAVCA, NA bca.org.uk to find your local service so they will all have different names so I'm up near Watford as is W3RT, Watford Three Rivers Trust. Um, depending on where you are they will have a different name but those are local infrastructure bodies set up specifically to support local community and voluntary groups um, of all different types. They will regularly send emails with funding opportunities, um, maybe have access to internal databases which you can use for free so definitely worth finding your local CVS if you don't know who they are. And likewise, your local authority may also maintain some kind of voluntary sector support unit. Again, that's going to vary depending where you are, and they may operate quite similarly to the CVS function. Um, and some will also offer a portal, portal for advertised tenders and grants that you should be able to access for free. 
networks and talking to people is really important so the more you talk to people the more you can find out and the more opportunities might be available as well and the final um, area that you may just want to think about in identifying opportunities is social media and i appreciate that for those of us who are super busy social media can definitely be a bit of a drain um, so my advice is to kind of my husband puts it time box it um, you know give yourself a 20 minute section on a monday morning or something to have a look use hashtags on twitter to help you find things follow your local cvs for example or this particular um, sector organization that you know supports your organization um, your, your sector you work in the arts or health for example then see if you can follow them and they can have a look occasionally likewise facebook there will be certain groups potentially for your sector or your role. There are some that's worth look at joining. So fundraising chats, a group of around 14,000, I think 85, 90% of which are UK based fundraisers, talking about all kinds of income generation, COVID related and not different kinds. Um, but there's also a COVID-19 charity preparedness group that was set up right at the beginning of the pandemic. It's less active, but it does still post things about funding opportunities in relation to COVID and, and the response to that. So those two are worth having a look at if you are on Facebook. Okay, so what next? How do we go about? So I've um, last last part of today before I hand over to you guys to ask your questions. Um, I asked Seth um, Reynolds if he'd let me steal this slide from, um, from a presentation I attended that he gave. He's from NPC um, recently and he said he I was allowed to, so that's fine. Um, so he um, created, uh, generated this model which I thought was a really interesting way to think about where are you as an organisation in your adaption to this new normal. So the first box, the first column we've got is ad adapt and survive, then we've got adapt and alter and adapt and innovate. So what's meant by adapt and survive? Well at adapt and survive you might be seeing a major drop in income um, which potentially threatens where you are as an organisation, your integrity. Um, you, that might be exacerbated by a rise in demand for your services and potentially even a reduction in staffing if they've had to be furloughed and still not brought back or if you um, aren't able to bring them back. And therefore your ability to delivery programmes is compromised. Um, there's a bit of a vicious capacity circle there. If you have no capacity for delivery, you have no fundraising capacity, then you can't generate the money to survive you. So you're very much in that survival mode. The second, adapt and alter. This is where we may be seeing some continued effects of COVID-19 on the way that you deliver your service, and that's going to affect your income streams. And my hunch from the responses to the poll at the beginning today is most of you are probably somewhere in here. Um, but you are sufficiently robust to survive, um, you're adjusting core aspects of what you do, you're maybe delivering slightly different ways, or you're internally reorganising. So I imagine I think quite a lot of you are there. And some of you might be at the point of adapt and innovate. So you may have bought, um, you know, if they, in, so one organisation said they've developed new income streams, for example. So they've bought a sudden mainstreaming or increased profile of your services and what you do. So you an opportunity to, to increase and diversify um, or it might be that social shifts are um, changing so you can you, you're able to to innovate to, to try new things to pilot something that perhaps you've wanted to do for a long time that you've never been able to do so you may need to understand where you are but funding I'm finding has also started to follow this model initially survival was the key and a lot of the funds which originally came out were very much focused on this existing grant makers increasing or bumping up existing grantees with additional funding and we started to move on from survival there's a few still there but we're mostly moving into that um, alter state so adapt and alter where we're seeing after effects and that rebuilding phase and funders are looking at what are the ongoing needs likely to be, what's the lasting impact, where, where are we going to be and that's when we start to, we haven't quite got to the innovate although we're starting to get there, funders are mostly at alter but I think over the next couple of months we'll definitely start to see funders want to fund that innovation, that, that longer term things like um, black and minority ethnic community support, mental health, physical health, things that the obesity, things that we're seeing have really come to light as a result of COVID-19 that the yeah, sector organisations have responded to and are continuing to respond to, but all the funders in particular are looking to say, oh, let's not let go that 
go back under the, the stone that it crawled out of. Let's keep that stone unturned. Let's see how we can respond differently to make sure that those communities, those needs are not ignored again as we revert back to whatever the new normal might look like. So I think we're starting to see that as spur forward at the same time as some funders already returning to business as usual. So, okay, we did our survival, we funded those organisations, we, um, we're going to go back to opening up our grants to everyone as per normal, um, and we're starting to see funders re return to that um, and to, to move on um, and go back to where they are. So we're, we're in that kind of alter stage, shifting towards innovation while others are going back to things, nothing ever happened. So I think the first thing for you to think about as an organisation is where are you in that journey? Are you still in survival mode? Are you adapting? Are you innovating? And then when you're looking for funding, look at the funding that's supporting that process. Or are you just going back to actually things haven't changed that much? We're just where we were. This is business as usual. Let's go back to where we were in our income generation. But if you have changed, then what might you need to think about? And your income generation absolutely needs to be in line with your strategy or business plan or the way you articulate what you need funding for your case for support so have things changed you know do you need to update where you're going funders and donors are really looking for 18 months ahead then they're finding it hard to look much further i mean i can't look much further than next week to be honest with you is what i'm doing because who knows what the rules are going to be funds and donors are really not looking very far in the head so whereas you might have had a three or five year plan is that still relevant? Can you look that far ahead given we don't know quite what the new normal is going to be like? Um, and so I think you need to, when you're talking to your donors and your funders and aligning with them, making sure that you're reflecting in that conversation how you've changed, if you've changed, why you've changed, and what that means to you as an organisation. Because your funder, your donor, your supporter will buy your direction of travel. That's what they're going to want to support with, is, is where you're going. So you need to be confident and you can articulate what that might look like. And it's totally fine if that is only 6, 12, 18 months. They're not necessarily expecting you to be able to forecast the future. As I said, most of us couldn't do that. Would, would I be, think I would be sitting here talking about this a year ago? Absolutely no way. So, you know, I think funders and donors, supporters will understand that. So you need to be responding to what they're expecting as well. And for those of you who perhaps are thinking about delivering different services or working in a different way, do you or can you look at different income streams? And I put on the screen here the um, NCBO's income spectrum, which is a, a, if you like, a spectrum from asking to earning. And at the asking side, we've got the donor giving gifts. Um, moving as towards earning, we've got a funder giving grants. We then got our purchaser buying contracts and our consumer who's giving on the open market. And so you may be that historically you've generated most of your income from grants or vice versa from the open market, from people buying services, so hire of facilities or purchase of goods and services. Actually, given what's happening with your organisation, does that need to shift? Have you opened up opportunities to start talking to donors? Have you, um, if, if the open market is struggling because you can't offer goods and services, well, where else can you? So to give a, a real life example of this, as Lucy mentioned, I'm a trustee of a community business. We're an arts and community organization. Um, most of our income in the past has come through hire of facilities, through um, delivery of arts events, through opening of a, of a, we have a coffee shop. And clearly a lot of that has stopped completely we've just opened up our coffee shop again in the covid secure way but it's not generating enough money to wash its face so our open market income is massively down and we're having to find ways to supplement that but we are working on our donor you know an area which we've always wanted to really increase the number of people who, who fund us as a local community group who support us so we're looking at ways that we can increase our gifts that we can engage with new people new organizations and, and really push that so so we're using this as an opportunity as a time to to try and diversify our income so not just the earning but also the asking and if you're going to do this what new skills or resources do you need to to develop 
or, or obtain. So for us as an organisation, we know that we need someone who gets social media and can help us use Instagram and Twitter and um, TikTok, or whatever it is, to, to generate profile, to generate a younger audience, to bring new blood into the organisation. Most of our volunteers, um, most of our attendees are over the age of 70. They're the ones least likely to return to us quickly. So how do we bring in those people to the organisation to help us reach a new market to receive those who are perhaps more likely to, to come and visit us and, and take part in activities and help us generate income to survive. So you might be wanting to ask some of your questions out, how do you, how do you gain that knowledge and information? How do you bring new resources to the organisation? Okay, and that's me. So now it's over to you. Um, just very quickly, so questions and answers me. Um, my contact details are here and I will see this, this the slide pack will be shared so you can always get in touch with me after um, today as well. I'll stop my share of my screen, um, hand back to Lucy to help us take this a bit and open to you for questions and answers. Well thanks, uh, thanks tremendously um, Leo, I thought that was um, a really interesting um, presentation on you know, telling actually a very very uh, complicated context where things have changed you know very quickly in quite a short period of time um, and some of the some of the trends you were talking about I, I, I reflected on so for example when you were saying about the fight for space between um, unregulated social movements and also businesses that have a purpose but aren't necessarily structured in the same way that everybody here is um, it's just a very different it's a very different context for um, organizations to be working in um, particularly the challenge at the end of ultimately you know where is everybody on that scale um, and, and, and really pragmatically what you know what can be done and what can each organization do to actually um, adapt um, to, to a challenging context so thanks very much I found that fascinating um, uh, but I'd really like to see if anyone's got any questions so I'm going to stop sharing my screen a second um, and just really invite some questions. So uh, please do uh, please do pop questions in the chat. Um, you are also very welcome to uh, put your video on and have a discussion. We are still recording the session, um, so if you don't want to be on camera, uh, you can uh, you can just pop a question in the chat, and I can ask it for you if you want. Uh, we did have a, we had a couple of questions come I in. One in question the at the beginning, yes. Uh, well, so there, was, there was a question at the beginning, wasn't there? I didn't, yeah. Shall I read, yeah. So I'll, just, um, I'll just um, uh, recap on that one for you. Yeah. Um, Kate, if you wanted, wanted to, to say this uh, yourself, you're very welcome to. Uh, but Kate English asked, um, uh, the organisation where she is, they're actually hosting mobile COVID testing sites at their venue, um, which means that it's hard, uh, but that, that means if they're to continue that, they risk turning down paid... Uh, bookings because they're not getting paid to host the COVID sites um, and so a lot of organisations will have particular challenges around their venue hire so the question was do you know of any funding that might support that very particular scenario but I guess it's also um, funding that is available to actively reduce COVID levels rather than simply how your organisation adapts to the impact of COVID. I don't off the top of my head know of any particular funding as just using the resources that I've you know highlighted particularly the charity excellent framework you might find something on there um, it may also be worth just talking to um, local authority services so be that you know your health team and the local authority or the clinical commissioning group because obviously this is direct health related service so it may be worth trying to get in touch with them directly and see if they have any ideas they may not have some cash I don't know it depends so it depends on local area as well everything is so localized um, worth having a word with I go my first point of call would be the, the databases and then local authority and then um, also um, yeah um, the CCG the health services locally I think that'd be my starting point yes uh, Kate says they're the ones that oh, are the ones running it oh <laughs> at least you know who to talk to <laughs> um, yes okay so, um, so I, I think that being honest with them and saying you know like this this is the situation whilst we're happy to keep hosting you we need to cover our costs can you put your hands in your pockets so have you asked them that Kate <laughs> So Kate, you're welcome to contribute on the chat if you want, um, whether you've... Hi, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, 
Hello, we've had an ongoing conversation with them. They have no budget. It's quite right. galling to see that social influencers and celebrities have been paid to promote um, COVID testing. Yeah, uh, but they know. actually have, yeah, exactly. They have no budget to give to us. Um, and as right. you can see in the recent news, you know, nobody's getting COVID tests because there aren't the places yeah. to do it. Here we are with our car park and we'd love to be able to do that. But now we're actually opening up and getting more businesses wanting to hire us again. We yeah. can't turn that down for something yeah. that doesn't pay. And it's, it's just an yeah. awful situation really. But, you know, yeah. I'll go, I've gone back to them and said, we're in this situation. They know where we're at. So I just wondered if there was anything. I didn't know whether if that's counted as a statutory service that they're providing, because that would mean that we wouldn't be able to go for a lot of uh, the kind of grants that are available. Yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it's a difficult, it's a difficult one. I think it will depend very much on the funder and what they're funding. And say, you know, normal rules have a little bit gone out the window um, at the moment. So, you know, I think it's it's worth asking the questions. Um, and always feel free if there's a funder you're not sure, then would you support this because it's, do you think it's statutory? Give them a phone call, ask them. Um, so, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I, I was hoping somebody would come up with a magical funder. Like, yes, I'm sorry. One, I figured, <laughs> no, no, no. I figured that was probably the case. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. Um, I've just noted uh, a question from Helen. Yep. Uh, Leah. So Helen asks, or Helen comments, uh, that she finds a list of funders that she should apply to and then uh, misses the deadlines. Any tips on getting better organised at managing, um, managing the speed of which one has to respond? Yeah. And I think, I mean, for me, I, you know, setting fake deadlines. So whereas the deadline might be Friday, if I set myself the deadline of Wednesday, then I give myself the buffer. Um, you know, if you can block time out in your diary to do it, I know it's really tricky. You know, your diaries are busy, but if you can just block out two hours, which says, write this bit in your diary a few days before the deadline, then do so. So you use your calendar, use your diary that you use for other meetings and put the deadlines in, put deadlines before the deadlines so that you've got time to, to make Make sure it happens so that you don't you don't ignore it and you don't miss it and if you can block time out I, I would um, other than that I'm not sure I have anything I mean however you do your to-do list put it at the top <laughs> I use Trello boards which I find really useful you can put deadlines and things on I know I know not two hours work but you know if they were two hours one day and then two hours the next day or whatever you know hopefully they should get quicker if, if you do a lot of them but yeah I, I'm, I don't have a magic one for that one either I'm sorry <laughs> Unfortunately, so um, we've got a couple of questions coming yep. through. I hope, hopefully that was helpful, Helen. Um, one thing I've heard about is I've um, spoken to a couple of uh, businesses who are doing um, fundraising accountability uh, bodies in, mm. in that because there's, there's yep. a need to respond to so many grants so quickly at, at the time um, that they're actually uh, coming up with an agreement of sharing, um, reading each other's applications and things that they wouldn't have done previously. So we've got a couple of other questions or comments. Yep. So Madeline says, when you were talking about trends, you were talking about place-based. Yep. Um, I don't quite understand this as face-to-face -face services are quite difficult to reinstate. And actually, and Graham's question afterwards, which is, um, actually I'm gonna answer both together because his mm -hmm. question is about, you know, on every time you turn on TV is another advert by another national charity. How do we compete for smaller private donations? And I think they, they kind of fit quite nicely together. So by place made doesn't necessarily mean face to face. It means that they're it's about a place as in a, a physical community or a physical place of interest. So services don't have to be face to face to be place based. So they can still be about a geographic area. So if I think about things like Facebook groups, for, I'm sure everyone has a Facebook group for their local geographical area that talks about it. It's, it's not a face-to-face -face thing, but it's, it's rooted in a, in a physical area and the needs of a community. So place space is more about community-focused services. They don't have to be delivered face-to-face. -face. And I think that, to, to answer Graham's point about how do you compete for smaller private donations, is using that to your advantage, about thinking about how do you... Um, what, what have you got over those national organisations which can be faceless and you know large national I don't see the impact actually what you have as a smaller you know community place-based organisation is your opportunity to demonstrate the impact at a local level so while small private donations um, you know I, I can see the impact of my donation when it's up the road in my community centre I can't necessarily see what that happens if I give it to, to Oxfam or Save the Children because it's overseas and I might feel less impacted. So that's about you thinking about how within your resource you can really share what you're doing with your local community to say thank you 
um, in a way that perhaps a national charity wouldn't be able to do. Um, to make it more personal, that point of personalisation, and, and keep those local people sort of feeling loved and supported. So I think the two actually sit very closely to me. Hopefully that, that helps a little bit. I mean, we're never going to have the, um, you know, I only do work with small charities, as I'm a trustee of a tiny community business. You know, we're never going to have the budgets of those big national organisations to do TV campaigns, although they're a lot cheaper at the moment than they were, um, you know, to do those kind of big major, you know, campaigns and direct mail, we're never going to do that. So we have to think about what we've we got that's different. What we have is a sense of community and let's build on that, let's bring people together. Excellent. Graham says yes, thank you. That was, uh, sounds like that was useful. <laughs> and a smiley face, I like that. And a, smiley face. <laughs> and a, and a thumbs up. So oh, wow, so it's all useful. going. <laughs> and a dog with a picture. <laughs> it made me think that, um, you know, you're talking about the shift of the kinds of income that people are, are, are having and actually the, the the need for individual giving, particularly if things like corporate corporate donations are reducing, is that a lot of uh, a lot of community organisations and community businesses um, may feel uncomfortable about drawing on their supporter base for individual giving donations because often their supporter base are people who are on low incomes or might actually be in receipt of their services. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you've got any kind of thoughts or tips on individual giving with your um, immediate kind of community contacts? Yeah, um, so a couple of things is, you know, people, if they value services, often do feel able to give even in a small way. And actually, you've, you know, a lot of studies out there will show you that those on low incomes are more generous than those on higher incomes. So I think there's a, an element of not being scared to ask, why, why do people give to charity? Because there are, so I think there's, there's an element of that, but doing it in a way, that feels safe and, and, and affordable because even a two pound donation can mean a lot to you and a lot to the supporter who feels brought into your service. The other thing is that peer pressure and peer giving is key. So if you have got someone who can only give, afford to give you two pounds, well, that's amazing and that's fantastic. That they've even been able to do that. They can then ask their peers more comfortably to support it. So they may have friends who perhaps aren't struggling quite as much or family members who aren't struggling, who once they've given, they feel they can ask others to do so. So use your supporter network as a network to get messages out there. If you're going to do something like a crowdfunding campaign or an online giving campaign, use your supporters as promoters. They don't necessarily even have to give at all. Helps if they do because they feel more able to ask others, but even if they can't, um, use them as promoters and supporters. So you can help us. You're a fantastic ally, a supporter of our organisation. Can you help us by sharing this on your social media feeds? For example so think of other ways that they can help you or volunteer you know can they can they help you with volunteering to help write some of those bits perhaps depends on their nature of zoom hugely diverse i'm sure that was helpful for me thanks <laughs> <laughs> um has anybody else got any more questions we've still got a few minutes to go so don't be shy even if you think it's got a niche question you're very welcome to ask otherwise i've got i've got one more but i don't want to take up too much space but I'll ask it just in case it gives it buys anybody a bit more time it's just it's following on from that Leah is um you see one of the things that's changed in in fundraising in the fundraising world in maybe the last five years particularly is the growth of crowd crowdfunding and obviously we've got lots of platforms and things and you pointed to that in your in your presentation it's just if you got any um any advice on things to avoid or things to be aware of if community businesses are looking at crowdfunding particularly? Yeah, so crowdfunding can be really powerful and really fantastic, but also really, really hard work. So my tips for crowdfunding would be have something very specific, quite low scales. So you, you know, you don't want to fail. You want to be able to hit your target. So don't go, oh, we need £50,000. Start, start low. Um, you can only crowdfund a certain number of times because ultimately you're, you're talking to the same audience over and over again. So just be aware of what you are going for. And for me, crowdfunding is more about developing support and supporters and contact details to build on than it is necessarily about the money. So think about it as a massive tool for promotion, for profile, for engaging people, as opposed to necessarily a funding opportunity. But do also bear in mind a lot of local authorities, um, local enterprise partnerships and so on at the moment in particular are match funding crowdfunding campaigns. So if you go onto Crowdfunder, you can search, for example, for any match funding available. So if you get over a certain amount, they will match fund up to a certain amount and so on. So it's definitely worth looking at what opportunities are after to double your income from that. But 
think specific think broad think profile and maintaining relationships as your as your main your main outcomes rather than cash um, because yeah it, it's unless you've got an enormous database of people to go to or a huge social media following you're unlikely to generate a lot of money from it excellent i think that's really useful advice i think uh, crowdfunding can be quite hard work but is is excellent in terms of Building up those relationships is like, as you said, to, to perhaps be looking at an 18 month time frame is it's important to be really developing those relationships so that they are there for you at a later point rather than stopping fundraising and then needing to kind of re-engage re, re in, in 18 months time. So yeah. a good tip. All right. So final call out for questions, people. If you've got anything you'd like to ask Leah. Um, other than that, um, I will, um, I'd just like to say, a huge thank you. I thought that was extremely, um, extremely helpful and informative. So thanks very much uh, to Leah Selinger. Um, we will obviously share the recording of this present of this presentation, um, which has Leah's contact details in it as well. So I'm sure uh, she'd be happy to uh, to hear from you. I'm just noting one comment on the chat. That was a thank you. I thought we were going to get another question, uh, but thanks very much uh, for your comment, Teresa. She says thanks. So I wish everybody well. Um, I'll send you off on your Monday afternoon. And thanks again, Leah. And we will make sure that this recording is circulated uh, as soon as possible. So thanks very much, everybody.